One very specific issue which has come up quite often in Japan over the last decade is the status of the board of directors for a company. When we think about the governance of the firm, the board of directors is key because, as we mentioned earlier in relation to principal-agent relationship, the board of directors is the pivot point. It's the connection between the owners of the firm, the shareholders, and the managers who run the company day to day. So the board of directors give oversight and give approval to the strategic direction that the management sets and then implements. If the company finds itself in a bad way, if uh, the firm is in danger, for example, of even going bankrupt, then the board of directors typically will intervene, may bring about a change in the leadership of the firm, that is, replace the CEO uh, and push for the replacement of other senior executives, for instance. So day to day, or more month to month, typically board of directors meet something like once a month, unless there's a major issue. Um, confronting the firm. So the board of directors is more of a oversight role than a day-to-day -day managerial role. This is why we draw the distinction between governance and management. Now in a sense what happens is that the board of directors when it's working well is a counterweight to or a check upon the top executives on the managerial side. So top executives day to day, because as remember, as Lindblom described the company, it is an island of command in a sea of mutual exchange. Companies are hierarchical. The CEO, the chief executive officer, um, the old joke is you know, that the CEO is the chief executive because they can execute anyone career-wise. They can fire people. So the CEO has considerable authority. Everyone else works in the chain of command. So who monitors the CEO? Ultimately, it is the board of directors and various institutional checks and balances that are overseen by the board of directors. The CEO is picked typically by a nomination committee. The committee is made up of members of the board who run the recruitment process and the selection process. Uh, there is typically a remuneration committee which determines how much the CEO and other senior executives should get paid. The controversies at Nissan around Carlos Ghosn and issues of executive compensation really came down fundamentally to issues of board oversight and whether there was a lack of board oversight and whether uh, Carlos Ghosn had become uh, too powerful as a CEO. In that case, it was particularly complicated because he was also the CEO of Nissan's largest shareholder. So representatives of Renault on the Nissan board were in some sense involved in a process of oversight of their own boss back at Renault. So that was potentially con conflictual. Also, those committees that I mentioned did not exist in the Nissan case. Nissan, however, was unlike many companies, in it had a relatively small board of directors. Many Japanese companies traditionally have had huge boards. Uh, it was often seen as a late career reward for people who'd worked very hard in senior management, that they ascended into heaven in a sense, they got a seat on the board. And this Japanese practice of largely recruiting the board members from inside the company also tended to weaken oversight of senior management. Effectively, what happened was you had people who came through the management career track in one company, often worked there all their lives. The pinnacle of their career was then to oversee their juniors uh, who were running the company. So there weren't so many external voices. In the last couple of decades, there's been a very strong emphasis in Anglo-American countries on having external directors. These are people who are independent of the day-to-day -day management of the firm. So they're independent directors. And so the view there is that these independent directors can bring a more robust oversight of the senior executives, the day-to-day -day managers who are leading the company. 
Uh, Japan has moved much more in that direction. Uh, Japan's corporations law was reformed about a decade ago to bring about a system more like the Anglo-American model for companies with committees. That's the, uh, the shorthand version translated into English to have those committees I mentioned. Generally, guidelines to recommend smaller numbers of board uh, members and the rationale being that if there are too many members, no one takes responsibility. That if it's smaller numbers, then uh, clearly their own individual accountability uh, is made abundantly obvious to everybody inside and outside the company. Too small a board and you forego the opportunity to bring in uh, external expertise. To return to the Nissan case, we see Nissan of course has adopted those committee structure but they've also moved towards more external directors. And there's always this question about are directors independent or not? In the Nissan case, um, after Carlos Ghosn uh, was removed and fled Japan, um, one point he uh, made, or one claim he made, was that one of the ostensibly independent directors was a former uh, Ministry of uh, Economics, Trade and Industry official and brought a policy agenda hostile to uh, a potential merger between Nissan and Renault. These are complicated claims and we don't want to get into it here, but there's always going to be questions about principal agent relations. Carlos Ghosn's argument was that this, yes, independent in some sense, uh, but too independent from the interests of the shareholders. These are always going to be uh, issues for debate, uh, the clear thing is that uh, we need an open and transparent nomination system for members of the board of directors and that ultimately actually is the collective responsibility of shareholders because in the, in the Japanese company tradition, even though the board members were all effectively recruited from the existing management, they were nonetheless appointed officially by the annual general meeting of shareholders. So active shareholders demanding that you have independent qualified board members to overview the management of companies is a very important element of corporate governance. There are also some other issues about whether you should have stakeholders uh, other than shareholders represented directly on the board. In some countries, such as Germany, you see trade union representatives being on the board of directors. And this is a, a complex set of issues. The view in the Anglo-American world, especially in, uh, amongst academics, very much schooled in American corporate governance, is that that complicates the principal-agent relationship. That the primary principal-agent relationship is between the shareholders and the agents who run the company. And once you start to introduce representatives of other stakeholder groups on the board, it confuses who the company is run for. That said, uh, such a notion of shareholder capitalism has really been under challenge in recent years. And we see a, at very least a uh, rhetorical shift towards what's sometimes referred to as stakeholder capitalism, which is more common in Europe, particularly in Northern Europe, for example, in Scandinavia and in France and Germany and uh, the Benelux countries such as, such as the Netherlands. Um, even if we accept uh, the stakeholder capitalism notion though, there is a really important point that under all circumstances, managers and those involved in broader governance oversight do need a decision rule, ultimately in whose interest is the business run for. So we'll see that a lot of very progressive companies that are focused on being socially responsible and in treating their employees well, will often say, that being a good employer, being a socially responsible employer and a socially responsible company is also good for shareholders. So they at least assert that there isn't a principal-agent tension. 
Although when companies get into a lot of strife financially and they have to make difficult decisions, when there is a very clear trade-off between, for example, hiring um, or f more significantly firing um, costly employees and the profitability of the firm and being able to return profit to shareholders through dividend payments, we see that ultimately there very clearly is a tension between shareholder interests and employee interests, at least in the short term. So those principal agent issues are always going to be complex. And the role of the CEO, supported by the board of directors, is to step carefully through the minefield of potential conflicting interests between all of the stakeholders in the company all of those who have an interest in the company uh, as employees, as suppliers, as managers, as shareholders.